so much for all of the bounty that you have bestowed upon this country. This country is the first nation in, in, in your world that is built on an idea. That idea is liberty, human freedom, and the dignity to praise you and build your temple of Jerusalem in every community. And that is by, by doing what is right, by treating others with respect and love and praising your name wherever we go. Lord, this is a tough, tough, tough time to live in. We have, complicated, we have a complicated world, complicated leadership. As this election season nears, please give everybody, give all American voters, and especially Arizona voters, the, the, the understanding, the peace, the ability to see through those who do not want to pray, for, uh, pray in your name, those who want to pray in their own name, but we ourselves, Lord, we are not looking for a candidate in order to be our leader. This is a candidate to be our representative, to fight for us so that we ourselves can fight for you every single day. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Do pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty small group today, so what I thought would be the best thing to do, there's a couple of, there's a couple of people here who, who haven't met me before. I want to give a brief introduction, so those of you who do know me, please bear with me. <laughs> You've heard this story before. And then what I was going to do is give you an update about the CD1 race, and then I'll answer any question about any candidate. Listen, I'm open and honest about who I'm voting for, so, and I'll give you my reasoning. It might not be the way you go, but as Ronald Reagan said, you agree with me over 80% of the time, you're my friend. <laughs> so. So there you go. Um, I'm Adam Quasman. I was born and raised in southern Arizona. There are conservatives that come out of Tucson. It does exist. They wear the boots. <laughs> and uh, let's see, what was I falling down? Um, and uh, I hold a master's degree in economics from George Mason University. So if you listen to Rush Limbaugh, a wonderful economist named Walter E. Williams, subs in for Rush every so often, African American free market economist. He was my professor. Uh, my specialty in economics is what we call the Austrian School of Economics, which is the role of government in society. Um, it is the, the economic understanding of human freedom. I worked at uh, not only on Capitol Hill, but off Capitol Hill at the Cato Institute in their Center for Constitutional Studies. After I finished my master's, I founded my own economic consulting firm, 2510 Consulting. It is from Leviticus 2510, my favorite quote in the Old Testament, proclaim liberty throughout the ends of the earth unto all its inhabitants. It's the quote that's on the Liberty Bell. Um, in Hebrew, Ukratem Dror Ba'aretz Lechol Yoshveha. I read and speak from Hebrew. Um, I, uh, I came back home in 2009 where I got my hands dirty in politics uh, and, and I managed a congressional campaign uh, in the 2010 election. I ran for the state legislature in 2012 successfully. Uh, you are all my boss. <laughs> I, I represent you in the Arizona legislature in the House alongside Steve Smith and Al Melvin as our state senator currently. Uh, in the legislature, I was named by Americans for Prosperity as the most free market member of the Arizona legislature in their 2013 cumulative rankings. My, my total cumulative score is champion of the taxpayer. I made a name for myself stand, being the first really to stand up against our own sitting governor in our own party, Jan Brewer, when she wanted to pass the largest expansion of the welfare state in Arizona history, that is that Medicaid expansion. She came into my office. She told me I should be quiet because I'm merely a freshman. I told her that I don't I don't fight for her, and she doesn't mean I don't represent her. I represent the 217,000 people in LD11, and we're not having that. We're going to fight for our liberties. Um, I also voted against Common Core. I have 100% pro Second Amendment record. I have 100% pro life record. Um, I believe I am an across the board conservative. I believe when government is limited, we go as far as our God given talents can take us. My economic understanding placed me as the vice chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, that's the tax committee. I also serve on appropriations, so money in and money out goes through me. Um, and also on the Commerce and Joint Legislative Budget Committees, those two other committees. So essentially what has to do with our economy, that's where I that's where I focus. That's my main my liberty is of course everything that draws me, but but economics is my specialty. And my signature in the House is I wrote I wrote the bill to repeal the income tax entirely. It did not get out of committee. It did not even get a couple committee hearings because the Speaker of the House didn't like that for some reason. 
I fought tooth and nail against crony capitalism wherever it stood. I don't believe taking your tax money to give to big business cronies is the way forward. I believe in low taxes across the board for everybody, reduce burdensome regulation, grow that private economy, empower entrepreneurial capitalism. That's the way forward. Uh, for this, that's that's humanity. That's the that is what the founders intended. Uh, I'm a big Tenth Amendment guy, uh, and, and the enumerated powers in our Constitution through Article One, Section Eight, those powers not delegated to the federal government under the Constitution are hereby reserved to the states and the people, respectively. That's worth fighting for. The founders knew it was going to get murky, but they knew that different states, different strokes for different folks. You know, the different states were going to treat different problems differently. And I, for one, don't want to deal with California's problems. I want to deal with Arizona's problems. And that's what, what really we have to get back to. Um, although I believe I, I have signed a pledge to support a constitutional amendment for term limits, it's not the end-all, be-all. The end-all, be-all is cutting spending and getting back to our constitutional enumerated powers, as the founders intended. If, it, it should keep everybody in this room awake at night that we have over $100 trillion in debt, if you count the interest on the unfunded liabilities. That's it. Uh oh. I said, hopefully I said everything okay. You just got a phone call. <laughs> so, he was nodding his head before he walked in. <laughs> uh, uh, that, and that's what we need to fight for. I fight against both parties when need be. I believe that there are really three parties in this country. Um, the, the Democrats are in lockstep in, in big government, uh, in, in big government, either you know, an aspect of socialism, but closer to an aspect of Mussolini-style fascism where they keep the institutions of the free market, but they're just so regulated, so controlled that, that the actual oomph there doesn't exist and it's government that's empowered. Um, and the Republican Party is really split in two. It's the same battle, it's nothing new, it's the same battle that was in the 60s between the Goldwater Republicans and the Rockefeller Republicans. It's the same battle that was in the 70s between the Reagan Republicans and the Gerald Ford Republicans. It's the same battle that was in the 80s between the Reagan Republicans and the Bush Republicans. It's the same battle. And that is what we're fighting. And I am a proud Western-style conservative. That means liberty first. And um, let's, let's see what else going forward. Uh, a little bit about me. I have not met the girl of my dreams yet, though, but I really, really want that to happen. <laughs> so you don't need to worry, even though you're like, you're 31, I don't see a ring, don't worry. I just haven't met her yet, I will, and I'll have nice babies. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, I just bought my first hunting rifle. Um, uh, it goes, I'm a big shot, I'm a big uh, waterfowler. I'm a big dove hunter and duck hunter. Um, I am a terrible duck hunter. But I love it, and I will definitely kill more so ducks. You've been able to learn. You bought a shotgun. You didn't buy a rifle. No, no, no. I bought my rifle this year. I just bought a hunting oh, rifle. Right. I had my shotgun. Right. No, I have my Stoger, and I bought my Mossberg Duck Dynasty style, uh, <laughs> uh, Duck Commander style. But I just bought my first rifle. I bought a Savage because I put it for deer, and I was like the one guy who didn't get drawn. You know? yeah. But let me tell you, my, 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 my accuracy, I've been practicing, so that's good. Um, uh, I've also recently gotten into archery. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, you're, are you an archer? Oh, I'm well, just left my house. Oh. I've got seven record book white tails on my wall. I've got a so flying. I'm so jealous. You know what? I'm going to steal like part of your gear heads and put them in the, in the congressional office. <laughs> and I'll pretend they're mine until, 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 until I can replace them with real ones. <laughs> well, they're real, but they're not mine. <laughs> so uh, that's about that's me in a nutshell. Um, yeah. This, NRA member? I'm a oh, lifetime member of the NRA, perfect record. Here, here's the deal, guys. If we keep sending the same mm -hmm. big government, career politician to Washington, we're finished. Okay, we're done. It's on both parties. I believe the Democratic Party is going to throw us right off the cliff, and I believe that the that the Republican Party will walk us slowly off the cliff. <laughs> we don't send conservatives, but either way, we're going off the cliff. We've got to send more people in the ilk of Ted Cruz, in the ilk of Rand Paul, in the ilk of Mike Lee, in the ilk of Trey Gowdy. Those people have got to go to Congress. We have great representatives in Arizona already. David Schweiker, Matt Salmon, uh, Trent Franks, and Paul Gosar. These people are leading the fight. They just need reinforcements. That is what I believe through the House members that don't have anybody in the Senate. That's well, well, we'll talk about that. We'll get, let's cross, let's, as, as my mind. As my Marine friend said, let's burn that bridge when we get there. <laughs> so, so, guys, I, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, my grandfather was so poor. when he came, He's first-generation American. They were so poor in the south side of Chicago. Now, I was born in Arizona, but 
South Side of Chicago, poor Jewish family, tuberculosis ripped through the South Side. My grandfather was the breadwinner of the family at the age of either 11 or 12, depending on who you ask. Uh, they were so poor, there was no bed to sleep on. They slept on the floor. My grandpa slept on the floor with coats over him in the Chicago winters. Uh, there was just no food to eat. He goes to, uh, he asked my grandma to marry him before she goes to war. She says no. <laughs> she said, come back alive. He always told me he fought, he went to, he went to war to fight for liberty and he survived the war to marry my granny. <laughs> Earned three bronze stars for bravery. Uh, most recent Battle of the Bulge, where it is, I believe, if it's like 213, it's bigger than a platoon, right? So what would it be? Company. It would be a company, yes. His company of about 213 went in and seven came out, because the Panzer tanks just, just destroyed them. He destroyed, he personally took down, disabled two Panzer tanks by hand by attacking them at night with hand grenades. I mean, it was unbelievable. That's why he earned that third bronze star. It was unbelievable that story. I can see it. In the, you know, I've seen the. You know, when they do the account of why he got the award. So that was very cool. Um, taught me values. Taught me values every day. My father was the first in the family to go to college. My mom dropped out of college as a senior to put my dad through medical school. That's commitment. Uh, Dad was 19. Mom was 16. They just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary, and they don't count it as a 40th because. They've been together much longer than they've been married. So, so there's the family aspect of it. And from, and from legal immigration to, to first generation American being, being start, started to two generations later running for the United States Congress, that is the epitome of the American dream. I, I, I never, uh, you know, to Barack Obama, it seems that this is the wrong way to go about doing it. You know, I, I don't deserve anything that I fight for. Well, I have amazing values, a hard work ethic, and I fight for liberty, and, and that American dream is going away so quickly that I have dedicated this part of my life to making sure that future generations will have that there. That is why I'm doing this. Thank There's you. no questions. There's no questions asked on that one. This is why I'm doing this. Um, so I, where do you stand on the amnesty? That's a great question. <laughs> I am the only candidate in Congressional District 1 who's 100% against amnesty. I believe there are three forms of amnesty. The first being just flat out amnesty. Okay, that's a rape. The second form of amnesty is a path to citizenship. I'm against that. The third form of amnesty is legal status for those who are here legally. I am the only candidate who's against that as well. I believe in a rule of law. Because when you don't have a rule of law, we're all done. And that is why Sheriff Joe Arpaio has endorsed me for Congress. There, it, it, he, he looked at the candidates and said, okay, that's the guy who's been consistent from day one. I am the only one who has signed a no amnesty pledge in front of, what, 250 people, 200, 200 people? In Casa Grande, I signed it in front of everybody. It said exactly what it did. I still have the pledge. I posted it online. Everybody can see what it is. And Sheriff Joe said, if I break that pledge, it'll put me in tents. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I mean what I say, and I say what I mean with this. So what do you plan to do, or what would you say was the answer? If we're not going to do amnesty, how do you plan for this state to afford to send all those people out of this country? So the first thing is that that it's argument expensive. is a democratic canard. That argument to me, if you don't secure this border, first and foremost, I don't want to have a discussion about anything else. See, they've already put us behind the eight ball. Because if we're already negotiating securing the border out of this, because we know what they're going to have. They want their amnesty, and they don't want to have the border secured. Mm -hmm. So let's start with building the double air border fence. We're going to, we're going to start with sending, the, sending thousands of troops to the border, and we're going to enforce our I-9s. And you sent thousands of troops to the border without the government. That's why I'm running for the governor. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think the governor. Can, I don't think the governor can do it. Actually, all governor candidates are saying they're going to do this. Like, this yeah, is the yeah. federal great, government. Great, 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 so, federal thing. That's what I'm saying. Right. So, it's my understanding. I read today that the legislature passed the law here in the last day or two before they they recess the Congress that each state now can send. Uh, uh, their National Guard to the... Uh, Either way, it did not pass the Senate, so it, it wouldn't matter. I don't, I'm not familiar with the bill, but if it passed the House, that's as far as it went. No bills have gone through the Senate. Oh, like, yeah. that yeah. Yeah. So it's not... Right. So, so here's the thing. That's first and foremost. The second thing that we do, and once you have, once you have in my opinion, my belief, once you have E-Verify enforced. So I, when I studied abroad at Cambridge University, um, I did a year in England. 
and I worked at the RAND at RAND Europe in their center in their terrorism studies. We did we, I focused on Kurdish uh, uh, extremist organizations, and I had a work permit because I got a stipend to work there. So I had to get the, the, the British government said I could work there for a certain amount of months. And a week before, not only did I get a, a letter, but RAND Europe got a letter that said he gone <laughs> after about a week, or else they're going to face tremendous fines and and, and more penalties. Okay, so. Every country seems to be able to do this in, 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 in Western Europe, except for one. And, and, and except for one country, and that's France. And they haven't been, they, I'm not saying that they're perfect, I'm saying that they're less perfect than other countries who have been able to really enforce their work permits. America has no concept of this whatsoever. They will not fund E-Verify, and they will not track businesses that, spon that, that sponsor illegal aliens. And in my opinion, if, if you don't let them have, if you don't let people who are here legally have a, have a driver's license, if they can't, get uh, a bank statement, if they, can't, if they can't open up a bank account, they can't fly, if they can't work, then it is not an economically efficient thing to do is to be here. I, I'm an economist, and the first rule of economics says people respond to incentives. And we have incentivized, we have disincentivized legal immigration while incentivizing illegal immigration. There's, there's three problems here. There's three issues actually happening, and nobody wants to, they, they want to lump this into a comprehensive thing so that the special interests can take over. Who wants to take over the unions, the Chamber of Commerce, all these people with these special interests? First thing, it should be three bills. First bill, secure the border. That's, that is one bill. Second bill is fix the illegal immigration problem. That means changing the 1998 law, that means making sure we fund the verify, that's all that aspect to it. Then third thing, Fix the legal immigration system in this country. It's really hard. That's right, but that doesn't mean we. I'm, I'm, I'm not running to do easy things. I'm running for hard. That's well, why. Well, I mean, it's really hard to become a legal citizen. That's and that's. It's, it's extremely expensive. That's that's right. Let me. My good friend Ilya Shapiro, the the uh, the head of uh, constitutional senior fellow of constitutional studies at the Cato Institute, born in Moscow, raised in Canada. Went to Princeton and Chicago Law. Just became a U.S. citizen this year. I mean, and he's doing a job that most Americans won't do, which is defend the Constitution. <laughs> so, so and, and he's a you know he's a libertarian, but he's but he just became a legal citizen. It took him years and years and years. And there was a period of time between getting a between working at a law firm and working at the Cato Institute that there was a struggle there. He didn't know whether he was going to be there or not, but. He had fully committed to being an American citizen and, Mar and, and being an American. We need to be able to keep the right people in while keeping the wrong people out. And, and this is, like I said, three parts. And Sheriff Babu just talked about this in Tucson. Secure the border, illegal fix, legal fix. It's all three of those things. Because the economies of Arizona are different. You know, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. We need seasonal workers sometimes. Now, does that mean we all need seasonal Hispanic, uh, uh, Mexican or not, or other than Mexicans coming in? Maybe or maybe not, there's plenty of out of work Americans too, has to be part of this conversation. So, but that, but it mean, but there still are workers needed. We don't assume always that it means that we need immigrant workers. And there, but there are people who want to, A, become citizens from south of the border. There's B, we want people who just want to work. San Bernardino's is home for a while, and then come back home for themselves. Not everybody wants to be an American citizen. So we need to be, and three people who want to study here. So we need to be able to be, it is not an impossible fix. I think the biggest problem is twofold. One is the Democratic Party completely just wants to legalize everybody so that you, you, you've created new American citizens. And this whole thing of legal status is a total canard because sure, you guys don't become legal citizens, but all your children do. And so they get them on the demographics anyway. Barack Obama will pass amnesty unilaterally this summer. I can bet, I will bet 500 bucks on it, you know? I'll put, no, I don't have 500 bucks. I'll bet a donut on it. <laughs> I'll bet a donut on it. I took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. I expect within the next two weeks, Obama will uh, pass blanket amnesty. Right, everybody and what will that do? That will solidify the Hispanic vote, that will energize the, the Republicans will, will win big time in the midterm. Oh, we'll, we'll just, 
I mean, even the Democrats in Congressional District 1 don't want that. 70%? Yeah, yeah they don't want that. So um, he will try to go to Congress into impeaching him, which I think is a tremendous error. I think it's a big mistake. Um, in my opinion, yes. Do we have case? Is there a case there? Yes, but in all things, impeachment is not just a legal system, it is a political rule. Mm -hmm. I think a censure is a much better way to go about doing it, and I think going after Eric Holder, who clearly committed crimes and can be convicted in the Senate, um, and then looking at Jay Johnson as well, because he's not but he's not supporting the law. So that's we have to think strategically on this as well. We still do. I mean it's not it is not a cut and dry legal case. It's, it's it is a political world from day one. You still have to win the Senate. Adam, so, do you believe it should go to the Supreme Court? If he imposes blanket amnesty within the next few weeks, I don't know. without congressional consent and approval. Sue. I hate the law. I hate that, though. Doesn't that give, isn't that just a blatant violation of the Constitution? Yeah, but we don't have, see, see, James Madison wanted this in the, in the notes of the Constitution. Here's what's great. You know, the, 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 these, the leftists have destroyed logic in America. They said, well, we don't know what the founders really believe. Well, actually, we do know what the founders believed when they wrote the Constitution, because the notes of the Federal Convention were written by the author of the Constitution, James Madison. You could go on Amazon and order, and I recommend you all do, buy the notes on the Federal Convention. It's actually pretty cheap on Amazon. It's maybe $5 on Amazon, because it's such, it's such an old print. Um, uh, but they, he wanted a court, uh, he wanted an office of overseeing, another branch of government that oversaw where you had members of the Supreme Court, you had members of the Senate, and then members of, I believe, the executive branch saying if a law is constitutional or not immediately and overseeing that. We don't have it. That was never put in the system. So Boehner suing, I think that's a big error because that punts the actual, that punts the, the power of the House. The House should not whine. The House should, should act. And you should be condemning, you should be censuring, you should be cutting funds. It should be zero money to, to huge departments unless they fund to rein these people in. That is what you have to do. That is where we are at. Uh, the, the Congress has the power, of the, the House has the power of the purse for a reason, and, you are, and, and, and it's the, the people are in control. Article 1, Section 8 is for the people. It is for the people's house. It is not for the president. And, and in my opinion, we need a little bit more, there's ladies in this audience, intestinal fortitude. That way we use the different body part. Intestinal <laughs> fortitude um, to, uh, to, uh, in the House to be able to stand up. Um, you know, some things you just, why are you running at this point? Why be a congressman if you're not going to fight for liberty? You know, I, I'm, you're doing it either for a pin, I, and I'll be honest with you, I think Andy Tobin's doing this for a pin. He's turned out of the, uh, the, out of the state legislature, he's turned out of the House. He doesn't live in the district. He can't even vote for himself in the primary. He could legally do it. He couldn't legally do this for the state house, by the way. He's doing it for the, for the US Congress, because you just have to be a member of the state, a uh, citizen of the state, you can run for any, you could run for, or Scottsdale Congress against mean, Schweiker if you want to, you know. Um, but he literally has said this to people that, oh, I'll become a lobbyist if I don't win. I mean, it's a, that's sick. Those people should never run for office. I don't care what party you're in. Those people should never run for office. But that guy is trying to tell people that he's a conservative, and it's just not true. He voted for common court testing. He wrote his own Medicaid expansion bill. Uh, he's just, he's been known as the crony capitalist king of Arizona. You know, that guy is just, to my opinion, null and void. So now you have Gary Keene also in this race. Um, he's a rancher. He's from the northern part of the district. Nice guy. He and I agree on a lot of our words. But the question is, do we have time for just words? You can look at, you can look at Gary Keene, you can look at me, and the difference, the really big difference between the two of us is, OK, well, what did Adam do when he actually had to vote? And it was hard. And he had, he had lobbyist influence, and it was all that. And he voted down the line, conservative. Uh, uh, principles of freedom. And that you look at my record and you can say, okay, I trust that guy. He's dependable. I, it's not just words, because guess what? Every candidate, have you heard a candidate who said I'm against amnesty? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm for amnesty? No candidates are saying they're for amnesty. Have you heard any candidates saying that they're, even Hoopenthal, who's been supporting Common Core down the line, running for superintendent of education, he's now saying he's against Common Core. Uh, it, it is, this is a tough business. You gotta have a, you gotta have a steel spine to run for office. In, in my opinion, and then be in office. But the fact of the matter is, to me, I, I still wear my heart on my sleeve. It still gets to me. 
when I see how politicians lie. I, it really gets me. Because, because this profession, it's not even a profession, this thing that we do, this thing that we do is, is in my opinion, something that's safer because you're taking the people's trust. It's not just fighting for a constitution. It's the people's trust. And the second you, you throw that trust out, listen, I'm not perfect. I'm just a guy. You know, the, I'm not going to be the, the, the perfect public servant. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no, but, I'm gonna, uh, but here's what I'll do. I'll wake up every morning, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I know. I'll tell you this that I, when I told you just now. I don't know. I didn't know the answer to something. I'll tell you what I don't know. I'll tell you how I feel and where I'm leaning, and I'll apologize when I make a mistake. Who are you supporting Doug? I'm supporting Doug Deasy. And here's the reason why I'm supporting Doug Deasy for governor. Um, and it's not, you know, I have not, he hasn't asked me to publicly endorse him because I think he needs some of that line of money <laughs> in Phoenix. Here's why I'm supporting Ducey. I used to go to lunch with Doug Ducey often in my first session of the legislature, 2013. Uh, we went to Peter <laughs> for lunch and we talked politics and we talked philosophy and we talked economics. And in every kind, when nobody was looking and he, he was thinking about running for governor, but he wasn't guaranteed there yet either. When, when he and I were talking and the vision of the country, I believe what he said about, about free markets, I believe what he said about limited government, I believe what he said about the future of Arizona and growth. Now, can I guarantee you that Doug Ducey is going to be the governor that he has the potential to be? Absolutely not. Does he have a lot of, does he have a lot of room to fall? Absolutely. Can he be, does it, does it scare me of some of the people who are supporting him? Oh yeah, big time. But I'm going to tell you there's a there's a there's a gambling term. There's a uh, a craps term. You know, you bet on the come. You know, you're gonna they, that you're gonna hit your you're gonna hit your numbers. I think if Doug Ducey does 80 percent of the things that I think that he's capable of doing, he can be great. Not just good, but great. And so I'm supporting him on that. Can I be seriously disappointed? Absolutely. Do I trust? You know. Do I know where Frank, Frank Riggs stands? Yes, 100%. I can trust Frank Riggs to be a great conservative for governor. I think he'd be a fantastic governor. And I think that he's going to get 5 or 6% in this election. So I think we're down between, I think it's really between three people. Mayor Scott Smith, in my opinion, who's right out. He's a big government Republican. He, will, he, he is the opposite of what I believe. Then you have Christine Jones and Doug Ducey, both of which are saying great things. I know Doug Ducey. I, I believe that Doug Ducey is, is, is my guy. I have a lot of supporters who are supporting Christine Jones. I have a lot of supporters who are supporting Frank Rose. So I told you I'd be honest where I stand. That's the hard one. That's the There's hard one. There's a big smear campaign on TV about him. You know, how yeah, he overextended his franchise? Yeah, and all that. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I don't know. I, I, I was going to ask you, is that true? I have or? no idea. I have no idea. You know, I. I and, and if it, let's let's give it that. Let's say that it is true, which I don't think it is. But let's say it is true. Okay, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. By the way, the answer is probably to some people they felt like they got hosed, and some people felt they did great. And there's a lot of caveat emptor, and a lot of people. Let's be honest. In the '90s, franchised in places that they probably shouldn't have franchised. That's not to blame. You know, it doesn't mean that they were given perfect information. But you know, the world is very gray when it comes to these kinds of things. And yet, and so the answer is I don't know. But let's give let's let us assume the worst of Doug Ducey. Does that change the fact that he has openly said that he wants to repeal the income tax? No. Does that change the fact that he has been a very solid steward of our taxpayer money as treasurer? No. Does that change the fact that he openly fought against the lar the one of the largest tax increases in Arizona history, that billion dollar sales tax increase? He was the, he led that fight and he won it. Um, you know so. He's, he's got a, 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 a record that I could look to in the last few years, since 2010, and say, okay, he has done a good job as a statewide official, he's held himself clean and accountable, and he has fought for, for the values that I believe. Is that good enough for me? You know, is that, should that be good enough for you? I don't know. It's your, but boy, what a weird uh, election season this is, huh? There's really, I mean, <coughs> There, I have seen more, everybody's frustrated. You can see the turnout. Everybody's frustrated. They've lost so many elections. I mean, it's just, I don't even want to watch television anymore. I get so depressed watching President Obama. You know, I, I just, 
He ordered troops today to attack ISIS. It's now ISIL. It's not ISIS anymore. They've changed the name. Iraq, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. So it's now ISIL. So he ordered humanitarian aid drops, and then he ordered targeted strikes against ISIL. It's not going to be a, so. So here's first of all, our hearts and our prayers. Please pray for those for those pilots tonight, because we support our troops no matter what. But. You know, is it going to stop? Is a targeted bombing going to stop ISIL's army? Probably not. Maybe. Probably not. Is ISIL probably going to march on Baghdad? Probably. You know, this is people are saying that this could be a quagmire. This looks a lot like how the Russians had to fight the Afghanis for all these years. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? We don't speak the language. What's the culture? Can this draw us into a prolonged conflict? Conflict again? Sure. Do I want to send one troop over there? Absolutely not. Do I want to lose Iraq? Absolutely not. This is a this is what happens when America's strength in the world fades. The forces of darkness start moving forward, and it's and the mess that's left behind is a lot harder to clean up than it was in the first place. Boy, you know. I'm inclined to take Reagan's approach. Pardon? I'm inclined to take Reagan's uh, more Gaddafi approach. You know, he bombed his compound, and we never heard another peep yeah. out of Muammar Gaddafi. And I think maybe a few well-placed bombs in Muslim cities throughout the Middle East and North Africa would be the best thing we could possibly do. They, they back off. It, if they didn't, they would be crazy. Well, I, here, here's my big thing. I, there is no clearer open and shut case than Hamas versus Israel right now. This is the easiest. Okay, you have a terrorist organization that took over a government and is bombing innocent civilians. Blast them! Like, get them! <laughs> That's not a. You know, I'm a practicing member of the Jewish faith. I'm proud of my Judaism. I believe that the children of Abraham and the flock of Jesus need to come together to save this country. And every Jew in America should give every Christian in America a gigantic hug for thanking them for all the support that they give uh, uh, toward Israel and the Jewish people. Put that all aside. There is that there is a, a, a major global economic center in the free world is being ra is being bombed right now. That's Tel Aviv with a major stock index, major industry, a global global industry is being bombed right now by a bunch of troglodyte terrorists who use their children as human shields from the, from, a, a, from a terrorist compound that was next to a y, uh, that's next to a UN compound next to a school and they're doing it brazenly and half of America thinks that they're the victim that's crazy that's crazy so we have a lot of work to do we have a lot of work to do and i believe running for congress is not just about being one of 435 votes I believe that cultural change has to occur. And one of the things that I'm able to do, th this is not bragging, I just know where my strengths lie. You know, I'm never going to be a basketball player. <laughs> um, I can speak. I can talk. I can try to synthesize com uh, complicated principles of free markets, complicated principles of conservatism, and, and simmer them down to how it's going to affect your life and why, and why these things should be, should, why the world should be seen through the eyes of liberty and the founders. It's something that Milton Friedman was really able to do, and Jack Kemp was really able to do. So part of this, part of this idea of being a representative, not only in Arizona's first district, not only fighting for that overpass, not only fighting uh, to make sure that, our, that the EPA is out of our lives, to making sure that we fight to repeal Obamacare, and we fight to secure this border and no amnesty. Not only that, but it's going on, Fox News is easy. I want to go on Chris Matthews. Tell him, tell Chris, you give me a thrill right up my leg to be on this show, you know, and, and to say and to be able to explain to people, here is why we believe what we believe. We're not a bunch of, uh, uh, we're not astroturf. We're not people who who are angry. I'm not an angry. I smile all the time. You know, I I believe I believe that the founders and vision of this country is what makes everybody great and helps the 47 percent the most. It helps people on, who are poor and on fixed incomes the most. That's our vision for society. By, by freeing people, by taking a step back. I, we need to start showing that to people on television, in the radio. We do it really well on the radio, actually. But more on television, in new media. The fact that I'm young, I think, gives me a leg up as well. 
no offense to, uh, I'm, I'm going to use you as an example. No, I mean, when you have to start, a, you have to help a new generation, and you have to start fighting for liberty and trying to instill these principles in a new generation, you have, it, it's a lot easier for somebody like me to be able to, to speak in the same language as, as, as kids in college and kids in graduate school. I mean, I mean, just because of different experiences, different looks. That's why, okay, so can we take the fact that we all disagree with Marco Rubio's stance on amnesty? Can we put that aside for a second? Yes. That's why Marco Rubio is such an attractive candidate. Because he is able to connect with so many people across the board. It's an Obama kind of thing, almost. It's why, it's why Obama is so great. I go to college campuses, and you know what's so interesting? I was, on, I was at NAU, and I was able to speak to the college Democrats for about five minutes before I was in the future speaker for the college Republicans. And I asked the college Democrats who their hero was. And guess what they all said? Obama. Who's their hero? Then I go to the college Republicans, and I said, who's your hero? You know what they said? Ronald Reagan, Abraham Lincoln, Calvin Coolidge, the one guy who tried to be hipster. <laughs> Guys, dead, dead, dead. I love Ronald Reagan. I love Abraham Lincoln. I love Calvin Coolidge. That's not going to cut it today. It's not going to cut it in the internet world, the eye world, the personalized cell phones that keep getting bigger, the iPads that keep getting smaller, they're going to switch places at some point. You know? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> we need, uh, my personal opinion is, is we need, we need more Congress or senators like Ted Cruz and Mike Lee. Yeah. We need more congressmen like Trey Gowdy. Yeah. And I think you're going to be that kind of congressman. Well, I appreciate you're that. You're a fighter, you. and that's what we need right now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, here, here's the, Walter Williams used to say this thing. We don't need a majority. We just need a centralized group. And Mike Lee, everybody points to the three people. Mike Lee for, you know, and, and, and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul. What percent of the Senate is that? Talking. Okay. No, well, you should know the exact number. There's 100 senators. Yeah. Those are three people. Three yeah. percent of the United States Senate. Yeah. Change the culture of the Senate. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when the ten years ago, when the Republicans had total control, the Senate was still a place where people go to die. You know, good ideas go to die. It, they, they shook it up a little bit. They shook it up, and it changed the culture. We need to do the same thing in the House. But if three percent can do that, imagine what thirty percent can do. Imagine what fifty percent. I uh, kind of wanted to loop it back to the higher education sure. issue. So I went to NAU 10 years ago. Since then, the okay. price. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, since then, the price and tuition has tripled. Mm -hmm. I have a five year old son, and I am truly worried that me as a middle class American cannot send my kid to yeah. college in this country. I'm, you know, we're facing now 1.4 trillion in student debt. It's yeah. the expected next bubble. And I just want to know when you get to Congress, how are we, how are we going to fix this problem before so this bubble bursts? This is, uh, I'm going to give you an answer that you're not going to like, and I'm going to give you principles that you might like, okay? The, 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 the fact of the matter is, boy, are we in trouble on this one. And, and I can't give you the end all solution. But here's kind of where I'm tinkering. Here's my, here's my thought process, and but I can't give you, well, you know, for Obamacare, I can tell you, buy insurance across state lines, own your own health insurance, you take it with you, you lose your job, you don't lose your health care, you know, you, you have FDA reform, so you don't go to Mexico or Canada to buy drugs, so you have tort reform in the states, you know, those are great ideas that I think we get a whole package together to save health care in America. The student loan private problem is a much bigger problem, because it's harder to get back out of. So, here's what I'd like to see. It's employing our 10th Amendment, okay? You block grant a specific amount of scholarship, okay, to the states. And, and you end the student loan debt situation as we know it, not end it, but you end it as in the program that we see here. We still have federal funding of it. We still believe in federal funding of it. But it's distributed to the states. And I think a better solution might be looking toward toward that the scholarship side of it. So your 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 son or daughter? Son. Son. So your son has a B average, you know, in, in, in high school, at a, at a high school. Mm -hmm. Well, then they qualify for a certain amount of scholarship to go to a state college, in your state college. And maybe states can have a transfer system that maybe 80% of 
you know, you move over to, they want to go to UT Austin, they want to, you know, hook of horns. You know, and they maybe, maybe 100% would go to U of A, ASU, or NAU, but 80% would go to Austin, and then Texas money, 80% would come, would come here. That's kind of the idea that I want to see, because then it's, then it's more of the, of, of what I like to call that empowerment scholarship account, that voucher way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But is that going to solve the debt problem? I don't know. Because I'll tell you what, no interest-free loans, what are this, what, and if you're a business, and schools are still a business, what is the first thing you're going to do? Is raise your tuition. You raise your prices. Or if you don't raise your tuition, you raise your fees, which is the same thing as raising your tuition. So you have incentivized, you have disincentivized schools from doing the right thing, which is keeping tuition low. The answer is going to be tough, and I don't know. So as an add-on there, um, there's been you know, a 9% cut in National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. NIH, which are the two primary drivers of scholarships and fellowships of merit for graduate students in this country. Yeah. Do you agree that, well, of, of that giant cut to it, it has, you know, when my fellowship doesn't even exist anymore well, I, that paid I, my way through college? I tell you there too, you know, as much as I love I love the ability to, to be able to provide these things 130 trillion in debt. Do not forget that. You know, I, I don't think that, I, I think we have to prioritize just as any family at home has to tighten their belt in tough times. We're going to have to prioritize some spending. And, you know, is that important? Absolutely. Education is so important. But there's also other things that are so important as well. I don't, I, I just, to me, I get back to these founding ideals, and that is, where in Article 1, Section 8, does it say that there should be an increase in, in some National Science Foundation blood-based grants for education? It's, it, it's not that I disagree with those things, but this, these are part of the aspects that you send right to the states, and then let, the, let your state legislature figure out what's the best allocation for Arizona citizens who can apply for those grants. And, and, Furthermore, it, it, it allows, in my opinion, it might, it, you might have a better allocation of those resources, less waste, because you don't have a top-down 50-state bureaucracy plus territory bureaucracy. You, I, see, to me, I, and, and you can hold people accountable. I can yell at Steve Smith. I know where he lives. He lives just down the street. You know, <laughs> the only thing we're going to need from yelling at him sooner is a train going by. But we're going to build that overpass. You know, you know. So, so. When you have government that's far more accountable to you, I think that's a better way to go about doing it. That's where I, that's my thought process. I wish we were in a situation that I can, that we can right now look to fund everything. We are so busted. We're so broke. We're so broke, and there's only two ways out of it. Unfortunately, here's what it is: if we don't cut spending now, we don't severely reform our entitlements, severely severely reform our spending. We don't. And by the way. Your social security benefits are a promise that was made to you by your government, with your government. They are, you are owed 100%. Everybody here is either of working age or of retirement age. You are owed 100%. But raise your hand in this room if you think that, that a 20 year old is going to see one cent of social security. No, of course not. We better change something. We better change something or else it's not going to be there. I want, I want it to be there. Both parties have failed. Both parties have failed on this issue. Um, and we need to change things. If we're going to have, because we are facing, your son is facing a 70% income tax or facing hyperinflation, both of which are nation pillars. Both of which are nation pillars. That's it. Okay. Well, see, I think that, that, that as far as education goes, with, with the internet, with, with the, the education system has, as it's evolved in the last 150 years is ripe for, for a complete renovation. Most things, if you want to learn them and really want to learn something, you can go on the internet and do it almost for free. There's a few technical things that, 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 that schools may actually be able to do better. And of course, if, if there was real competition or, or some sort of real way that you could measure what you learn, most people could learn that without having to pay anything in schools. And yet the price goes up and up and up and and, 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 and and eventually there's got to be a way where if you're an employer, you, you test for the person's skills, and if that person can get that set of skills 
for a limited amount of money by some sort of organized internet course, right. eventually a whole bunch of institutions are just going to to collapse. So it's a it, it is a um, it's a monopolist model. It's yeah, a monopolist it's a monopoly. Model. Does everybody remember in the height of the Soviet Union they had the goom, the one store where where you got your pants and your, and your, and your clothes and oh Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is all in one place. The good thing about Walmart is they compete. So here, here's the thing: we have a monopolist, we have a monopolist competitive model for schools. Here's here's what I would like to see. And Arizona is leading the is the, on the forefront of school choice, and that is empowerment scholarship accounts, so that if you're born if you were born in a poor area, if you're from South Tucson, or born in a, in a poor aspect of a reservation, you can go to any school you see fit, whether it's public school, private school, charter school, parochial school, or pay for your parents who want to do homeschool. That's not an unreasonable thing. In fact. I consider it disgusting that I see the left who want to keep people down. They do. They want to keep people down because they don't want to see people get out of poor situations for, to give their kids a better education. You should have seen it. Have you guys seen that movie Waiting for Superman? Oh, gosh. It's about how they, changed, they had school choice introduced to, to Washington, D.C., and there were 16 spots available at this charter school, and hundreds of parents with their kids were hoping, praying, that they would get a lottery of, of their, their ball call so that their kid can have a chance to get out of Anacostia ghetto. It is the most heartbreaking thing to see, and it is the left and teachers' unions that have destroyed this concept. It's destroyed it. That's first of all. So we need to institute some school choice. Also, does anybody know here any seniors who are raising their grandkids? Does anybody know this? We have a, we have a lot of them in Pima County, yeah. part, and the house is paid for, so they live in an affluent area because their house is paid off. But they're living on social security, so they're not—they're not wealthy. They're just—they don't have a lot of as money expenses, but they were not prepared to have to raise their grandkids for one reason or another. Whether their kids weren't the best parents, or whether something happened, God forbid. We should be able to provide further empowerment scholarship accounts, vouchers, in my opinion, but it's really empowerment scholarship accounts uh, to be able to to allow those grandparents to be able to send their kids to any school possible as well. That's that is compassion. That's conservatism, by the way. Compassionate conservatism to me does not mean big government. Compassionate conservatism to me means choice. Um, good pay for good teachers, uh, uh, bad, you know, getting fired for bad teachers. <laughs> this is, Steve Smith has led the fight for that and 100% against Common Core. Common Core is to education what Obamacare was to healthcare. It really is a top-down educational approach that will destroy education in this country. Everybody's for standards. Everybody's for standards. The question is what kind of standards, who's administering the standards, what kind of data is being collected, how our children are learning, and once again, Arizonans should be for Arizona, should not be part of this big top down. It is, it is no child left behind on steroids. But this is how the government works. They, you know, they say they're out of it, they're not doing anything except the funding comes from if you play, if you play along. And so they, 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 I liken the feds to drug pushers in a lot of ways. The first one's free. You know, but then you got to pay, and you get your hooks, and you can't get off the you can't get off the dope, and the, and the amount of federal funds that are coming down that are conditional, not block granted, that I was talking about, the conditional funds are like dope. Um, can I talk about the race for a second? Is that, you guys want an update of what's happening in CD1? So ballots are in the mail. We're expecting 70% to vote early. It's going to be a really high early voter. I don't know if it's going to be an overall higher electorate this year. There's a lot of people who are just kind of down on everything. Good for me because the people who are up are the, are the real good conservatives, but I'd still rather see more people vote. Um, so I figure most people who get their ballots in the mail will probably vote by Sunday, by this Sunday, in the first two weeks. Uh, Andy Tobin ran out of money, <laughs> as rhinos are wont to do. Um, uh, he paid all his money to consultants. Last year, he, or last quarter, last three months, so I raised 110,000, because I've owned my own campaign some money. I raised 110,000, by, by some money, I mean all my money. <laughs> um, 110,000, uh, and Tobin raised 178,000. The difference is, Tobin spent 172 of that 178,000 on what? I have no idea. You should have just given me the money. I would have had a lot more fun in Hawaii. <laughs> and we have as many votes as he did. He's the, he is the laziest campaigner I've ever seen, um, and, and 
He is a, you can see the tracker nodding in the background. He just doesn't campaign. He didn't come here because he is a, he didn't come here be, not because he doesn't, he has something else going on. He's scared to talk with you. See, he can't, he's going to have to, you know, stumble. Well, I, I didn't, I didn't write my own Medicaid expansion bill. I wrote a bill to bring, draw, to draw down funds from the federal government for Arizona. <laughs> you mean the Medicaid expansion bill? Well, no, 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 it's not fair. You're putting words on that. It was a bill to expand Medicaid. Here's an article that says, Andy Tobin expanded Medicaid, well, has a plan to expand Medicaid in Arizona. Well, you can't believe anything you everything you read. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it, it, this is how our debates have gone. If you've watched the debates, it's that bad. I, you voted for the common point for park testing. Oh, I didn't vote for the park testing. That wasn't that bill. It says the title of the bill, Common Core Park Testing. Well, I didn't vote for that. Here's where you voted yes on the bill. Here's where I voted no. Adam, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's immature of you to bring this up. Oh, really? <laughs> sure. It has been the weirdest election. Um, Adam, but, do you think in a, I, I think I know the answer. Uh, I think you're going to win this race. We're going to win this race. Yeah. Uh, I think you've got an excellent <coughs> chance to be in for Yes. Do you believe that she will debate you? Yes. Yes. I think she will. Um, I made a mistake with the bus. Did everybody see the bus, the little bus incident that happened? Raise your hand if you actually saw what happened. You know what I'm talking about right now. Raise your, be honest. My, 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 my kid that's completely apolitical. No, he, he, yeah, that, that's the one, the first time he heard about the race. Okay, raise your hand if you have, seriously, I'm gonna keep your hand up. By the way, you see that? That's half the audience. That just shows how little people, and that made national. So, yeah, that's right. So I made a mistake. Um, I made a mistake in, the, in Oracle where I confused a, a well, it wasn't just me, but everybody confused uh, a bus of uh, a, a school of uh, campers for something that it wasn't. I took responsibility immediately. I was ambushed journal. It was an ambush journal situation. I was wrong. I'm a human being. I made a mistake. The, the, the point is so clear that we need to fight against illegal immigration. We need to fight for the rule of law. But because the left had a fun day with that, mm -hmm. because they blew that into such out of, out of proportion, it's a simple mistake. Mm -hmm. you know, Joe Biden makes mistakes every other day. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just think Joe Biden and I have a lot more in common than you think. You know? <laughs> but, uh, like, yeah, at least he was there. Yeah, well, that's a lot of people are saying. At least you were there fighting. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. It's a true statement. I was the only candidate there. Um, but I made a mistake. I take full responsibility for my actions. I, that isn't because I'm a politician, it's because I'm a man. That's what a papa taught me, you know, you make a mistake, you take, you take your ownership. That's part of being a man. So, I made a mistake. It was an observational error. I never wanted to hurt anybody, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's an observational error. I take responsibility. They, the left had such a field day with it that they think, I believe that they think that I'm somebody that I'm not. I think that they think that I'm, that I am, uh, uh, far less disciplined, they think that I'm far, that I'm, that I'm X, Y, Z, but they don't realize that I'm a reasonable, passionate, uh, uh, energetic person. I'm, ener I'm energetic, it's, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Italian Jewish guy. I'm going to be energetic, I talk with my hands, I need about four feet of ethnic distance at all times with friends, <laughs> or else I'm just gonna hug you or slap you in the face accidentally. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, to, if Andrew Patrick is, is dumb enough to debate me, She's going to be held accountable for her for her votes uh, for amnesty. She's going to be held accountable for her votes for Obamacare. She's going to be held accountable for mistaking her bosses, her constituents, for her enemies. They're her bosses. She she was caught on video walking out on a town hall when they were asking questions. At what point is it wrong to ask questions? It is unbelievable. It is in Holbrook, and and let me tell you, she's going to be held accountable. At what point is it okay that, that I can't, at what point can I not ask questions? They work for us. Yeah. These clowns work for us in both parties. Well, right. well, she was a minority elected congresswoman anyway. Well, well I'm gonna tell you right now that she's going home. She's going home because people are fed up. They're fed up with Anchor Patrick, and she's not, she hasn't been here. It's not as if she, you know, people say, well, I don't like her policy, but I like her personally. They don't know her. They don't know the real Anchor Patrick. That woman is a leftist. And she's a radical, and we're going to promote a positive vision of conservative solutions to save this country, get our minds open again, get that overpass bill, get our rural community restored, really fight for the suburban community, fight for our seniors. We deserve it. We deserve it. So 
We're going to do that. I, I fully expect to win the, the general as well. This district has consistently gone Republican in, uh, in midterm elections. And frankly, the, where Peyton lost it was down south, my stronghold, which is Pima County and the southern part of town. Are there so, any libertarians in this race? Not that I know of at this point. That doesn't mean there can't be later on, but, but uh, you know, tell the trackers don't. don't, don't Keep an eye on Andrew Patrick, but on. she doesn't think about it. Well, yeah, there have been some cases where they've actually paid, where, 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 where the Democrats, like in North Carolina, were actually funding the Libertarian to, 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 to bring up the vote. Yeah, it's funny business. But we can win. Why didn't your people respond to the Center for Arizona Policies voter guide? That's a really good question. It's a really good question, and I'm going to answer very truthfully. I filled it out today because I've had so much pressure to do it, and I didn't, well, here's the thing. I didn't want to do it, and here's why. I'm 100% pro-life. I'm 100% pro-family. I have a record that shows all those things. But, but. This makes it handy to look for it. Yeah, but look at question, look at the second to last question and read it out loud to the audience. Uh, changes to the World Wide Web that would make pornography available online only as an opt-out service. Is that the one? That's the one. Read it again. Um, do, it, it asks whether you support or oppose changes to the World Wide Web that would make pornography available online only as an opt-in service. Now, is that the reason, is that, is that what's been keeping you all up at night? <laughs> is that the issue? This well, is, well, there are- has to do with the whole philosophy of regulation. Right, right. So I'm gonna answer how I feel, uh, uh, how I feel about all these questions, and I'll answer, and I did answer, you go online and see where I, see how I feel, but I'm gonna tell you what my answer is and why I refuse I refused for a long time until I got so much pressure. You can leave any of these blank you want. Yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> but that kind of question is what turns regular, conservative, Republican, good, solutions-based candidates, and it turns it into a field day for trackers who take things out of context and then turn you into something you're not. That is a gift for the, for the, um, for the left. That is a what? gift. So you want to talk to Kathy about that and have her not. I did, but she doesn't. She, oh, okay. she, not, but she does. Last year, there was a question about entering adult clubs and how you're going to interact in adult clubs. I don't want Adam Quasman <laughs> and Stripper to ever be in the same word. Oh, right. Now we'll be in that because I said perfect tracker. So, <laughs> so, so, so here, here's the answer to that question. Here's the answer to that question. I, of course, I believe that if a if a library receives federal funds, then they should absolutely not or have a total ban on pornography. I'm 100% against pornography and 100% for protecting children. Of course, of course, we all believe that. But the second the government gets, gets carte blanche to make an opt-in, they have power for everything. That's the nose under the camel's tent that they want. And then they have power, and what is the first freedom that they're going to take away from us <coughs> once they can start regulating the internet? That's what I thought when I saw that question. They're going to take away that for you. Yeah, right there. They always do it. And I am very weary of, an of, 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 of answering surveys like that. So it was a personal <coughs> protest of mine against Kathy. Yeah. But I'm 100% pro-life. In fact, I have a different pro-life uh, uh, view screen than my opponents. Um, they have certain exceptions in their pro-life stance that I don't make. I'm a life of the mother exception only uh, kind of guy. I'm 100% pro-life. Um, and pro family, and you can go online and see the uh, see my see my survey answers. Right. So, but just know that, and tell your friends in, at church. Please tell your friends at church to go online because and see those answers. Because I didn't hide from answering questions. I made a. a I am so frustrated with how some of these outside influences with good. In, the, the road to heck is paved with good intentions, and that is paved with good intentions, and that's one of those things. That's a problem. For any other questions? Okay, so the race. Tobin's out of money, he's dead broke, he did four mailers, two of which were complete lies about me, but I did two mailers, he did four. There you go, that's on that side. The second front is radio. Keeney's bought a little bit of radio, he's done a couple of mailers. Um, then there's television, okay? And Tobin is so broke he was never able to get on television. I've been on television, I have an outside pack that I found out about by the news, which is really cool that they're helping me out. Apparently it's a good ad that's on television fighting for me. Um, and I will continue to be on television because of support uh, by everybody here. Our grassroots is the best. Um, we have, I have some of the best volunteers in this room. 
uh, uh, you'll see my signs. You, you, if you've got a door, maybe you've had somebody pass with you on your door, uh, you'll be getting phone calls. If you'd like to be a part of that, please let me know so you can help with that effort. We will get you a walking list. We can walk, you know, just maybe, maybe it's 30 doors. And that's it. Maybe you want to do it for an hour one time. That would really be great for me. That would really mean the world to me. Or if you want to make phone calls, you know, please let me know afterwards so I can so I can help you with uh, with that. But we're the only one, we're the only game in town with grassroots effort. We're the only one with volunteers. It's really weird, by the way. It's really sad. <laughs> but um, but so so financially, even though we haven't raised as much as everybody else, we've spent almost more than everybody else because we've been so very, very diligent with how we spend our money and how we allocate our resources. And so I'll tell you in the back, we have volunteers in every single part of this district. It is, it, our, our, our reach is everywhere. So that positive, conservative message. If you have a bumper, if you don't have a bumper sticker, throw it on your, I, don't, I gave my way, I have a couple more. Um, throw it on your car, name ID is everything. You know, K was man, <laughs> it's a tough name, but once you get it, you got it. Get it? Good. So grab a bumper sticker. If you need a yard sign, let me know. It says like 40 in this house right now. Um, vote for vote for Man Freddy for for, for uh, uh, city council. Definitely vote for Man Freddy. Uh, definitely vote for Brett for constable. Um, he's been endorsed. Both of you have been endorsed by Sheriff Joe? Did you not get endorsed by Sheriff Joe? Uh, you got endorsed by Plaza. That's a good one. Uh, vote for Brett for constable. Um, who else is running? What are the other? Oh, Justin Pierce. I'm supporting Justin Pierce for Secretary of State. I'm supporting Jeff DeWitt for Treasurer. He's a great guy. He reminds me of me. <laughs> Tall oh, for Steve Smith. Steve Smith for Senate. Your conservative team for Senate. Smith, Fincham, Leach. They, they figured it out. The big government guys figured it out. They are running the rhinos just like the Republicans. They're talking about amnesty. They're talking about conservatism. And they are lying through their teeth. You're going to see an ad with... Yeah. Um, Bartle, Holt, no, that's what, uh, Bartle, Grant, and Vince Lee. Because they're trying to pick one guy. They're trying to convince everybody. It's not true. They're trying to convince every. They're trying to confuse everybody. But Fincham, Leach, and Smith is the conservative team. You could vote for two for the House. Fincham and Leach for the House. Smith for the Senate. He is a superhero. Boy, Steve Smith. Oh, great. Yeah, I want to. I, I want to go there and. and and I want to come home so Steve Smith could possibly run. I'll talk to Steve Smith in the room for Congress one day. That guy is yeah. a, just a, he's a nice he's such a good guy. As good as guys can get. Um, what other offices? Am I missing any races? Corpcom. Uh, I don't think there should be a corporation commission, so you know, I'm fine with that one. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Nancy Smith for the, for the other city council oh, yeah. cycle. Two-year seat. Yeah. Two-year seat. Two seat. Nancy Smith for the two-year seat. Picked all the right people. Good. There you go. Smart. The piece. I don't know these two people. Lyle Riggs. Lyle Riggs. Lyle Riggs. What do you think about the carbon tax going through? Lyle Riggs. What do I think about the carbon tax going through? I don't care what kind of tax it is. I'm not for it. <laughs> no, I mean this is ridiculous. You're going to, you know, they want to. This whole thing about about global warming. I. You know what the best way to say it, God, I, I think the conservative movement has to change their tune about it, in my opinion, okay? The outright saying that it's not that it's not happening and all that is not resonating with the other side. I think the way you say it is this. We don't know what is happening. Because that is the true answer, by the way. Is it anthropogenic, human caused? Is it from the sun, solar caused? Is it a natural cycle? Is it all... The, the, qu the answer is you don't know. nobody knows. But here's what I do know. Higher taxes at the local level, higher taxes at the federal level, this hubristic notion that humans can, can change the weather <laughs> to, make it, to, make, to try to counter effects a, a process that we have no idea what's happening is ludicrous. But the costs of those policies are very real. The Navajo Generating Station, they just made a deal and they think it's a victory that only a couple hundred jobs are being are being shut down, as opposed to a thousand jobs are being shut down. It means your water prices are only going to go up a little bit. It means you're only going to get a little poorer. It means your food prices are only going to get a little higher. That's the reality of the situation. The reality is our lives, we are poorer. And I don't want to be living in a cave, not leaning against the wall because of the rare Sonoran moss that's against the wall. <laughs> Standing on one foot because I don't want to step on the, the striped 
neon tree frog, you know, and standing like this and not moving because that's what I have to do to protect the environment. Everybody in this room is a conservationist first. It's a conservationist. We believe in preserving the earth. Nobody wants to poison the air, poison the water. Nobody wants a poisoned environment. But a reasonable balance between human life and dignity and growth and economic prosperity must be placed first before, before these out of control, ludicrous visions of the left. We call them, you know, we call these environmentalists, we call them watermelons. Because they're green on the outside, but blood red on the inside. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, so, they're so left. So it's, I, um, I'm against the carbon tax. <laughs> and, uh, and I believe that free market capitalism, entrepreneurial capitalism, it will, cre will create the, the, the environment, to have the cleanest environment that we've ever had, because it will empower the Teslas of the world. It will empower the next energy sources. Um, I'll leave you with a story. And if you, if you, go, if, if you go whale watching, maybe in Cabo San Lucas, or, or if you uh, go to, go to uh, uh, San Diego, you go whale watching, lucky enough to go whale watching, get really high focus binoculars. Because under the whale's right flipper, it doesn't matter what whale it is, there's a little, they keep a little locket, okay, these whales, they keep lockets. And in the locket, there's a little picture of Abraham Gessler on there, okay? Every whale, you can see it on any whale, okay? This is not a whale's tail. <laughs> so, you see a little, they, see, they all keep it with them. Because prior to Abraham Gessler, we used whale oil in this country. And the, uh, the sperm whale was going extinct. Going it was going extinct in the 1800s. And a farmer named Abraham Gessler uh, accidentally found something called, uh, uh, something called kerosene in this on the ground. And he was able to refine it into gasoline. And he was able to work with John D. Rockefeller. And he was able to get funding from the, the horrible, horrible robber barons of society that provided entrepreneurial funding to grow this economy. And he was able to work with meat packers, and they invented refrigeration in the Midwest, and they were able to uh, uh, work with the shipping of this terrible, terrible person named Vanderbilt, and they were able to build railroads, and they were able to do all of this in spite of government. You know, the government, the, 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 the Italian school, it was the government that built those railroads. They built those railroads in spite of the government. There were many tracks laid down. There were many tracks laid down. And whether it's Abraham Gessler's entrepreneurial spirit that saved the whales, because he did save the whales as an alternative energy source, whether it was John D. Rockefeller who created the greatest growth in, 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 in human history by being able to, to really bring the Industrial Revolution to its fruition, whether, it's, whether it, is, uh, it is the financing of the J.P. Morgans of the world, whether it's the, whether it's the Vanderbilt, the Cornelius Vanderbilt the shipping, these are our heroes. And, and the Steve Jobs of the world, and the Bill Gates of the world, and the future need to be empowered. Bill Gates never had a lobbyist until the late 90s. Maybe even the early 2000s, he never had a lobbyist in DC. Where have we gone wrong? I promise you, if, I have your, if I'm lucky enough to have your vote for the United States Congress, I will fight for that American exceptionalism that we hold dear, because this is an idea. This nation is not done yet. If we remove the yoke that's off our government, we will have a free world, a safe world, a prosperous United States, and we will have a better future for our kids. And I, you know what I say? I say we fight until hell freezes over, then we strap on skates and fight them on the ice. And I promise you that's what I'm going to do in Congress. I'm Adam Quasman. I'd be honored to have your support.